Hello, everyone. This is the second segment of my ongoing YouTube series dealing with Bible prophecy, and I'm calling this one The First Messiah. Admittedly provocative, but guess what? It's not my title. I'll explain in a moment. If you take the name Jesus and the title Messiah, throw in the word before, you're going to cause people to raise their eyebrows, scratch their heads, perk up their ears, and I think many, many people ask themselves, what does he mean? Does he mean there was someone before Jesus? Because Jesus Christ, Christ is Messiah, wasn't he the first one to come and claim such things? Actually, the historian Josephus, who lives in the first century CE, records the period before Jesus, during Jesus's life, and after Jesus. And he documents and mentions as many as a dozen or more messiahs, depending on how you define the term. Davidic figure, king, high priest, king and priest together, various kinds of ideas that were circulating. But the problem is for these figures, he typically will give their name, maybe something about where they come from, like Judas the Galilean, what they tried to do, and then an account of how they were killed because they were all killed. I couldn't do a YouTube short on any of those figures, but this figure is not mentioned by Josephus. Interesting. And this figure that I'm talking about is the most documented Messiah next to Jesus in the ancient world. And yet people don't really recognize him or know much about him. So I'm just going to give you an overview and just introduce some of the main ideas as part of this series. I think it makes sense to start with the first Messiah in Western history. So what about my title? That title is the title of a book published in the year 2000 by Professor Israel Knoll of Hebrew University. And a few months earlier, Professor Michael Wise had published another book, a similar book, and it was called The First Messiah. So there's a title for you, First Messiah, same thing. I thought Jesus would be the first Messiah. Who's this? Well, this is a figure that people usually have not recognized as the first messianic figure. And I think they're right about this figure. He is mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls. About a hundred years before Jesus, he flourishes with his movement. And they believed he was the prophet like Moses, the final revelator to whom God had revealed all the mysteries of revelation, that they were living in the last days and he was inaugurating a new covenant right before the end of the age and the final judgment. Wow, quite a package. We could say all that for Jesus, but this is at least 100 years earlier. So who are they talking about? They were both talking about a figure in the Dead Sea Scrolls that is usually referred to in English as the teacher of righteousness. Now that can also be translated the right teacher, like he's the correct one, teaching truth. The true teacher, like not a fake, not a charlatan, or both. But the idea is he is the one to come. Now, I'm using Messiah in the same way that Wise and Knoll did as a generic term for the final figure who's going to come and wrap everything up, bring it all together. Messiah means anointed chosen, selected, designated, in that sense, we'll call him a Messiah or the Messiah in this case, because he's the first. So I want to take a quick survey look at him. Um, I'm going to use Geza Vermesh, the Dead Sea Scrolls in English, the complete Dead Sea Scrolls in English. You can get this. It's a penguin paperback. I think now it has a different cover, but the contents are the same as the one I'm using here. So I'm going to start with uh, what's called the community rule. The community rule was a scroll found in cave one. There were 11 caves altogether. 
And I'm just going to read the passage. It's in uh, column eight. And when these become members of the community in Israel, according to all these rules, they shall separate from the habitation of unjust men and shall go into the wilderness to prepare the way, as it is written, prepare the way in the wilderness. Now that alone should blow you away if you know much about the New Testament, because our earliest gospel, Mark, opens with that idea coming from John the Baptist when he's asked, who are you? What are you doing? And he says he's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. So here's this group, a hundred years before the time of Jesus, and they think they're preparing the way of the Lord, and they quote Isaiah 40, verse 3. If you go on to column 9, you have something else very important. Notice the phrasing. This is the time for the preparation of the way in the wilderness, and he shall teach them to do all that is required at that time and separate from all those who have not turned aside from all injustice. So there you have a reference to preparing the way in the wilderness, but also there's a timing to it. In other words, it's essentially saying, as we're going to see, we are the last generation. We're going to live to see the final judgment of God upon the world and the setting up of the kingdom of God. And we are the preparers of that way, calling out people to repent of their sins, to be immersed in water. Does that sound familiar? And to be part of this new covenant community. There's a lot of other parallels I won't go into in this particular segment. So I've got a whole course coming out on the Dead Sea Scrolls in September of 2023. So if you're listening to this much later than that, uh, you, you'll be able to find it online. It's called Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. But here I just want to focus on this business of the first Messiah. So in the community rule, column 10, there's another little phrase I want to read to you. It's talking about the community. And it says that they shall be ruled by the primitive precepts in which the men of the community were first instructed. Now notice until there come the prophet and the messiahs of Aaron and Israel. Three figures. The prophet is the prophet like Moses. The messiahs are the two messiahs, the one at the right and left hand. If that sounds familiar, I won't elaborate, but some of you know your New Testament. So this teacher of righteousness, as we're calling him, he essentially is the one they're waiting for. So when this is written, the community rule, the teacher hasn't shown up yet. So that's kind of confusing because how could the teacher not show up if we've got the community being formed, preparing the way in the wilderness and so forth? Well, there's another document. It's the second one in the book called the Damascus document. And in the opening of the Damascus document, we get the mystery of that question explained. Let me just turn to it. This was found, fragments of it at the Dead Sea, at Qumran in caves, particularly Cave 4. But a fairly complete copy was found in the 1890s in Cairo, Egypt, in the Cairo Geniza of the Karaites. Now that copy... In Cairo was not an ancient copy 2,000 years old, like the copies we have in the caves around the Dead Sea. It was a secondary copy of a copy of a copy that had been passed down all the way down into the later centuries, and we're not sure exactly when it was written. However, because we have fragments at the Dead Sea, we know that this scroll was probably found earlier made its way to Cairo, and copies were made, and people passed it on. So now we have a fairly complete reading. There are two main copies plus fragments. But here's what it says. It's kind of a exhortation. It's for the day of Pentecost or Shavuot, 
which you would read to the congregation and they rehearse their whole idea of who they are and what they're doing. But in this document, the teacher has come already. So notice, here's how we can put it together. What it says is, in the first lines, is that God punished Israel for being unfaithful and forsaking him. And he's talking about an age of wrath when God gave them up to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And then it says he visited them after 390 years from the time of Nebuchadnezzar and that first exile and caused a plant root to spring up from Israel and Arad and inherit the land. And then it says a plant root is a metaphor for a little fragile plant coming up in the desert, just a tiny little sprout. So they're saying when we first started, we were just a little sprout out in the wilderness preparing the way. And it goes on to say, and then they perceived their iniquity and recognized that they were guilty men. Yet for 20 years, they were like blind men groping for the way. So even though they're out in the wilderness preparing the way, like a little fragile plant, they might as well be blind men because the teacher hasn't come yet. So you've got 390 years plus 20 years, 410 years. So 410 years after Nebuchadnezzar, here's what it says. And God observed their deeds and they sought him with the whole heart and he raised up for them a teacher of righteousness to guide them in the way of his heart. And he made known to the latter generations that which God had done to them. Now, we can't take that chronology 410 years after Nebuchadnezzar and date this group very accurately. People have tried that because we know their chronological system was not what we use today, our Gregorian dates. So it is obviously to them a period of 410 years later when the teacher came. The main point here because our dating really comes from the scrolls, carbon dating, paleography, and all the figures mentioned in the scrolls. And we can put them pretty securely in the first century BCE. So you don't have to put a year on it. So regardless of the date, what we learn in this text is that it's 20 years after when the teacher comes along and God raises him up. Now, then we find out Further on in the Damascus document, and this is in copy B, actually. From the day of the gathering in of the teacher of the community until the coming of the Messiah out of Aaron and Israel. And I think that means two Messiahs. Remember, you're waiting for the prophet and the two Messiahs. As far as we know, the two Messiahs never showed up in the life of this community. But the teacher did. We just read that God raised up a teacher. We don't know how long exactly he exercised his career of teaching and leading the community. But in copy B of the Damascus document, the gathering in means his death. And we have other scrolls that talk about how he was killed and how he's persecuted by the Jerusalem establishment. So from his gathering in until the coming of the Messiah out of Aaron and Israel will be about 40 years. And so we get in the Damascus document a clock ticking that from the death of the teacher, it will be 40 years. Talk about Bible prophecy tied to your teacher. Someone once said in the first century, wonder who, this generation will not pass till all these things are fulfilled. Often in the Bible, the generation is 40 years. You know what I'm talking about, but let's stay with the teacher. So the idea here is that from the death of the teacher, the gathering of the teacher, until the end will be this final generation. So this generation believes that they're in the last days, and they believe the teacher has been sent to usher in the last days. Now, in a fragment from K4, K4 had hundreds of thousands of fragments, 
It's 4Q171. They're actually numbered. It talks about a little while and the wicked will be no more. I will look towards his place and he will not be there. And so they're going through the Psalms. This is from Psalm 37, verse 10, and they're interpreting it. So then it's like you quote the Psalm and then you interpret. You quote the Psalm and then you interpret. And guess how they interpret this? Listen to this. Interpreted, this concerns all the wicked. At the end of 40 years, they shall be blotted out and not a man shall be found on the earth. So all the wicked will be punished at the end of 40 years. So we got this 40 year countdown. So if we take their chronology without putting a date on it, that they established themselves and wandered like blind men groping for the way for 20 years. And then God raised up a teacher. And then the teacher was gathered after a certain amount of time, we're not told. And there's 40 years left we can actually put this together because we have a scroll. I've got it here. I'm just going to turn to it. And it is from cave 11. So it's just a fragment. It's called 11Q. That means cave 11, Qumran, number 13. It's also sometimes called the heavenly Melchizedek. It talks about when the day of atonement is going to come and all the sons of light will be atoned for and the jubilee will come. This group, by the way, calls themselves the sons of light and they redefine everybody else as the children of darkness. That phrase is only used one other time in all of Jewish literature, as far as I know, certainly ancient literature, and that is among the Jesus followers. Jesus refers to children of light Paul refers to his followers and says, you're children of light, not children of darkness. So once again, you've got a correspondence, if not a parallel. But anyway, so there's going to be the Jubilee. But notice it says it will be the end of the 10th Jubilee when all the sons of light and the men of the lot of Melchizedek will be atoned for. Melchizedek means my righteous king. I think it's talking about the teacher, but some people think it's a heavenly figure. Now, let me try to put this chronology together for you. It's very, very interesting. Most people think of a jubilee as 50 years, and for all practical purposes, it is. But a biblical jubilee is actually 49 years. This has been well established in lots of the literature. So that the end of the 49th year, on the Day of Atonement that it mentions here, you declare the new jubilee, and that becomes the first year of the 50th, which is really the first year of the next 49. So what you have is 49, 49, 49, not breaking the Sabbath cycle of seven years. So if you have 10 jubilees, right? 10 jubilee periods of 49 years, that's 490 years. Now, some of you who already know a little bit about Bible prophecy are going to know that that number, 490 years, is very, very important in the book of Daniel and has been endlessly interpreted. And when we study that text, we'll go into it more. So 10 jubilees, right? 10 jubilees would be 490 years. So it says that actually this will occur in the first week of the Jubilee that follows the nine. Now, follow me here. If you've got 10, and this is the first week that follows the nine, a Jubilee is 49 years, seven periods of seven, right? Seven, 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 49. So in the first week that follows the nine would be the first seven years of the 10th. Then you've got very close to 40 years left. So you get a pretty good indication that they believe once the teacher died, they've entered into that final 49-year period. And now they seem to be in the final 40 years as they talk about the death of the teacher. So apparently the teacher lived into 
that 10th jubilee following the nine, but there's still 40 years left. Okay, now there's a lot about this. Um, for example, 4Q174, it says, this is the time of which it is written in the book of Daniel the prophet. So they actually refer to the book of Daniel. And they also do in this Melchizedek text that I just read, and they talk about the anointed of the spirit coming. So this is a time written in the book of Daniel. And it's quoting the book of Daniel, but the wicked will do wickedly and shall not understand, but the righteous shall purify themselves and make themselves white. So they think they are the ones who are being made white, children of light, and the wicked are not going to understand because they're going to reject and kill the teacher. So this is beginning to sound very, very interesting if you've never studied the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, what happens? Well, guess what? The 40 years pass and the end doesn't come. And there's a war that's supposed to take place, this final apocalypse, a kind of Armageddon war, and that never takes place. And we can't exactly put a date on it, but we do read in this text about the Kittim, that's the word for the Romans, in the war scroll, which tells about the final battle. The Kittim will enter Egypt and be totally defeated. Well, you know, when the Romans, the Kittim, entered Egypt, they conquered, and then they went up north and took over the Holy Land and eventually installed King Herod the Great over the whole land as their client ruler. And so their expectations were just dash. They thought they were 40 years from the end, and you can picture that clock ticking as it got closer and closer and closer. So I talked in the very first lecture about when prophecy fails. But I've got a copy here of Josephus. And I want to, this is uh, the Jewish War, book six. I want to read to you something he says that relates to this in such an amazing way. It's after the destruction of Jerusalem in the summer of 70, August of 70 CE. And he's beginning to reflect on God's care for men. And he says, God shows all kinds of signs of what should have been expected. And then you have this quote, but what more than all incited them to war. He's talking about the Jewish revolt, the first Jewish war. What excited them? You would think a uh, desire for freedom or certain messianic leaders like Eleazar ben Yair that died at Masada or something like that. He doesn't name anybody to the effect that at that time, one from their country would become ruler of the world. So what he's saying is that the Jewish rebels who revolted against Rome were mostly inspired by a prophecy in their sacred oracles about a time, about a certain time that a final ruler would come. They took that, he says, to be a Jewish ruler, the Messiah. He's clearly referring to the book of Daniel as the sacred oracle. I think chapter nine, because he says something about at that time. So you got to have a prophecy that gives a date. And Daniel nine is the one that gives the date. 490 years after something happens, you get the prince who is going to come. And they thought that prince would be their Messiah, okay? And the Dead Sea Scroll thought that as well. <clears throat> and the Dead Sea Scroll group is reading the same prophecy, and they're thinking the same thing. What Josephus says is, you know, they missed it. This prophecy is actually talking about Vespasian, the Roman emperor, coming and destroying the city and the sanctuary. So Josephus is historicizing the prophecy and removing it from this kind of apocalyptic world and making it not even messianic in that sense. So what did they do when 
prophecy failed or when their expectations failed. In the Habakkuk Pesher, I'm going to just read you a few passages because we have some great things about the teacher. This is a commentary on the book of Habakkuk. It's very, very important. It quotes verses from Habakkuk and then gives the interpretation. So the wicked surround the righteous. That's Habakkuk 1 verse 4. What does that mean? The wicked is the wicked priest. The righteous is the teacher. This teacher was opposed apparently by a priest, probably from Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, let's go on to read some more about him. O oh, traitors, why do you stare and stay silent when the wicked swallows up one more righteous than he? That's chapter 1, verse 13. What does that mean? That means the members of the council who were silent at the time of the chastisement of the teacher. So the wicked surrounds and swallows up one more righteous, the teacher. You see how they're reading themselves into the text. This is very important. This is what prophetic figures have done throughout history. They find themselves in one of these prophetic texts, and we're going to do a lot of that as we go on. This is our first example of this, though. Reading Habakkuk and saying, that's us, that's me. So what happens? The council, probably the council in Jerusalem, stayed silent at the chastisement of the teacher of righteousness and gave him no help against the liar who flouted the law in the midst of the whole congregation. Now, this could have been a split in their own group. We're not sure because the liar does seem to refer in other scrolls to someone who broke away from the main teacher. And that's very possible. Now, column seven, this gets really good. God told Habakkuk to write down that which would happen to the final generation. Isn't that interesting? That's what we've been talking about. Final 40 years, 490 years, nine jubilees, 10th jubilee, the final 49-year period, and then the final 40-year period as the countdown. But he noticed this, but he did not make known to him when the end time would come to an end. Now, wait a minute. If he wrote down the final generation, but he didn't say when the end would come, what about the 40 years? I mean, they keep quoting that. They've got it figured out. Were they wrong on their date? Did they redo the dates and say, oh, we thought it's 40 years from here, but it's really 40 years from some other time. That's what often happens. Here's what they do. It's a very, very interesting move. First time in history as far as I know. Okay, it goes on to say, this is written about the teacher of righteousness to whom God made known all the mysteries of the words of his servants, the prophets. And what is written is that he who reads will read speedily or easily. In other words, the idea that someone's going to come and read and they're going to read speedily. They'll just buzz through it. I know what that means. I know what that means. I know what that means. That refers to the teacher. But look what it says. To whom God made known all the mysteries of the words of his servants, the prophets. Does that remind you anything? I'm, I'm not going to go to Jesus, but look at the end of Luke 24. When Jesus opens all the prophecies of the Bible and says, it is written of me, it is written of this, it is written of that. So anyway, this group, 100 years earlier, is talking about God making known all the mysteries of the words of the prophets. So this leader is claiming to know the secrets and the interpretations of the prophets. Then it says, and this is Habakkuk 2, verse 3. You can look it up in the Bible. For there is yet to be another vision concerning the appointed time. Now, wait a minute. So we got a vision, Daniel 9, 490 years, and there's another vision. Do we have that other vision? It shall tell of the end, and it shall not lie. Now, that's a quote in Habakkuk. So what it means is not another teacher coming or anything like that, but they're quoting that verse and saying, interpreted this means 
that the final age shall be prolonged and shall exceed all that the prophets have said for the mysteries of God are astounding. Wow, what a move. In other words, the teacher gave all these interpretations. This was the time, 40 years left, all the men of wickedness are going to be destroyed. The world will be over. The kingdom of God is going to come. But there's another vision. Well, what is the other vision? They're reading Habakkuk and saying, it shall tell of the end and not lie. So there has to be another end. And it means not a date, but the final end will be prolonged. So 490 years was correct. The group was not wrong. From the death of the teacher until the coming of the end is 40 years. But God decided to prolong it beyond what all the prophets said. So now we're in uncharted territory. Isn't that interesting? So it could come anytime. Very interesting to think about. You see how these things are going to get repeated and repeated and reused. And it really helps to start where it all began. Now, Next verse, really interesting. This is also verse three, the second half. If it tarries, wait for it, for it shall surely come. It will not be late. That's Habakkuk. And what they say that means is that if they don't slacken in serving the truth, in other words, they got to stick with it. When the final age is prolonged, they will live to see the appointed end as he determines but if you go in reading in Habakkuk into verse 4, you have the phrase that the righteous will live by his faith. That's Habakkuk. Now, Paul quotes that, as some of you know, taking it to mean something totally different. This clearly means that you're going to have faith in the teacher and what he taught. So let's read the interpretation. What does it mean to live by faith? This is mind-blowing. Interpreted, this concerns all those who observe the law, whom God will deliver from the house of judgment because of their suffering and because of their faith in the teacher of righteousness. Wow, that is so amazing to me. So what they've done is they've taken this prophecy that they were so sure of, and they've open-ended it made it elastic like a rubber band. And I guess finally a rubber band can break because it's like the vision did not lie, but that God prolonged the time. You find some of that in the New Testament. Look at Second Peter, about a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day, God's long suffering and so on. Similar thing happens. Similar thing always happens when expectations that an apocalyptic group has fails, fails to come about. And then they began to figure out how are we going to explain this? So I'm going to leave you with that to think about. The very first Messiah, the Messiah before Jesus came, he brought all of the revelations of the prophets to this group. They believed he was like Moses. He's inaugurated the new covenant. It's going to come in 40 years from his death, and it doesn't come. And they prolong the age, but if it tarries, wait for it, it will surely come. You can see writing that over the doorposts of the community. If it tarries, wait for it, it will surely come. We're going to dig into the book of Daniel next, since I've introduced it through these Dead Sea Scroll texts. And watch for my course on the Dead Sea Scrolls in Jesus, where we will go into all of this in incredible detail with all kinds of notes and helps. See you later.